This cross that we just looked at is called a monohybrid cross. Let me write that down. Monohybrid cross. Um, which just means we're looking at just one trait in this cross. It's possible to have more complex situations where we might be investigating two traits at the same time. That would be called a dihybrid cross, uh, but we're starting with, with the, more, the more simple scenario here, just a monohybrid cross. And um, just to make sure that this is in your notes, this square down at the bottom, this is called a Punnett square. And this is something that's super useful in genetics. Punnett square allows us to look at these different crosses and possible outcomes of a cross. Talking about alleles and homologous chromosomes, um, it's just kind of nice to have a, a visual to go along with this. So homologous chromosomes, again, this is referring to the fact that we get, um, that cells get um, a copy of chromosomes from their mom and a copy from the dad. So those two chromosomes, we would say, are homologous. They encode the, the same traits, encode for the same traits. So it could be like eye color encoded right here and eye color encoded right here. And depending on the combination of alleles that we get, that will actually dictate uh, the, the true color of eyes, for example. So um, each allele exists at a particular location on these chromosomes, and we call those locations loci is the word that, that's uh, the formal word for location on a chromosome. And um, just to show these different possible allele combinations, homozygous dominant, this means that both chromosomes have the uppercase version of the allele. Homozygous recessive, both chromosomes have a lowercase version. And then heterozygous means we've got some type of a combination. One has uppercase, the other has lowercase. In the example that we just looked at a moment ago with pea plants, uh, that was a situation where we knew the genotype of the parents going into that experiment. But uh, we can also do experiments kind of in the, in the reverse or in the, looking in the other direction. So sometimes there might be an organism that we don't know what their underlying genotype is. All we have access to is their phenotype. And maybe we want to figure something out about the genotype. This is something that comes up a lot in animals and in plants. Um, and so we're going to talk about this. This is called doing a test cross. So we're going to consider this black dog right here and we don't know anything about this dog's background. We don't know anything about its parents. Um, all we know is that it is a black dog. Okay, so black dog. And um, the other thing to know just about dog colorations, black is dominant to brown. Okay, so we know just from that fact, the fact that this dog looks black, that tells us that this dog has at least one allele for black hair color because that's dominant. So as far as its genotype goes, we know that there's one uppercase allele. We just don't know what that second allele is. It could either be uppercase B or it could be a lowercase B. So in order to figure that out, what is this missing allele? Uh, what we can do is a test cross. And in a test cross, we cross this dog with another dog who is homozygous recessive. So brown is the recessive hair color. Um, so we take this dog that has two lowercase b alleles, it's got to have two lowercase b alleles since it's brown, and we cross them. So based on the outcome of this cross, um, there are two possibilities. If this black dog is homozygous dominant, so if it has two uppercase alleles, then what we should see is that all of the offspring of the cross will be black because this parent dog could only give uppercase B alleles and this parent dog could only give lowercase B alleles. So the combo there means all of the offspring would be heterozygous, which means they'd all appear to be black. If, on the other hand, this parent dog is heterozygous, so if it's capital B, lowercase b, then here's the other possible outcome. Um, okay, so during meiosis, those alleles would segregate and um, the brown dog can only contribute lowercase b. So here are the possible combos, heterozygous offspring or homozygous recessive offspring. So in this case, half the offspring would be black and half the offspring would be brown. So based on the outcome of the cross, just by looking at the litter, looking at the color of the pups, we can figure out what the genotype of this dog is. So that's called doing a test cross. 
So in the case of animals and plants, we can design experiments that allow us to figure things out about genetics. In the case of people, of course, that's not possible. With human genetics, we always do studies retrospectively. So it's always looking back through the generations and figuring out information that way. Um, information about family history of particular traits is gathered into a family tree, and it is called a pedigree, just like with animals. And um, there are a lot of human traits that do follow the same Mendel's laws that we've been looking at here. Others, it turns out they have more complex genetics that aren't fully understood even still today. But let's look at some of these more common traits. Just This is mostly just for fun. It's kind of interesting because it's applied to people. So a few examples of traits. Uh, we could look at whether a person has freckles or no freckles. It turns out if a person has the allele for freckles, then they are gonna have freckles. It, this is a dominant trait. Uh, recessive is having no freckles. Okay, so you can look at yourself, you can look at your siblings and your parents, and you can kind of figure out about the inheritance of alleles just based on looking at the, the phenotypes that are present in your family. Widow's peak is another example. This is referring to the hairline, whether it kind of dips down into a V-shape in the front or not. Um, having a widow's peak is dominant. Earlobes, earlobes are another one that are fun to explore in your family. Um, earlobes can be either free, meaning there's some curvature down here, or they can be attached, which means the attachment is just kind of straight onto the head. There's no um, curvature back up like you see in the top picture. And I just want to show you a pedigree to go along with this particular trait. Let's do a little investigation of this one together. So here's an example of a human pedigree. And with pedigrees, always um, males are represented with squares and females are represented with circles. We can also um, either shade in the shape or not shade in the shape. And what that's indicating is whether the particular character that we're interested in is present or not. So in this case, we're gonna be looking at um, whether a person has attached earlobes or not attached earlobes. So if a person has attached earlobes, we're gonna shade in that box on the pedigree. Okay, so what we can see here, we're starting at the bottom. So remember, human pedigrees, it's always like, start with what you have and then kind of think backwards through the generations. So in this case, Kevin has attached earlobes and we know, we know, okay, that having attached earlobes is recessive. So if this person has attached earlobes, they've got to have, they've got to be homozygous recessive as far as genotype is concerned. This person over here is a sibling. So on pedigrees, siblings are always connected with a horizontal line. Okay, so these two individuals are siblings. This person does not have attached earlobes. So that means as far as their genotype is concerned, they've got one uppercase allele at least. They could have two, um, we're not able to tell. It could be either of those two possibilities. The fact that Kevin is homozygous recessive, this means that he got a lowercase f from both his mom and his dad. So both mom and dad up here um, have to have a lowercase f present. Okay, neither of them had attached earlobes though, so we know they've also got an uppercase f present. So right there, we figured out their genotypes, heterozygous and heterozygous, based on uh, looking at their, their kids. Okay, so we can we can trace this back really as far as we want to. We can keep going with the analysis, but that's just, I just kind of wanted to show that um, to give you an idea of how pedigrees can be analyzed for different traits.